by Frank Dickens, with Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, and Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy. Chapter and Verse. As C.P. Scott once said, a newspaper's primary office is the gathering of news. At the peril of its soul, it must see that the supply is not tainted. Would that the same standards applied to a firm's house journal, and in particular that of the Chester Perry organisation. Whilst admiring the diligence and hard work involved in the production of same, one may raise an eyebrow at the finished article, as I did when I set eyes on this year's bumper summer number. To give the background story, I must begin with a conversation between myself and the postboy in the buying department of the aforementioned company. Mm. Uh, there you go. I, uh, um, thank you. Were you here at the time of the great tea trolley disaster of 67? Shh, keep your voice mm. down, both boy. Walls have ears. Mm. And when speaking of the event, speak softly, as one would in an undertaker's parlour. No, I was not here. It took place before I joined the company. Well, what happened? Shh, shh, shh. Ears. But would anyone in the building today know what happened? I fear not. So many people vanished. Some say fled abroad to the continent or South America. Really? We shall never know the exact figures. <laughs> and there is talk of an unmarked grave in Highgate Woods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is pure speculation. Well, there must be records. Alas, all records were destroyed in the mysterious Great Fire of 68 when the east wing of the Chester Perry Library burnt down. There is talk of a connection between the two events. Yeah. <laughs> Again, pure speculation. What about the great luncheon voucher swindle? Shut up, child. If you've been born during the war, we've been none of us left at all. I only said I about the... what you said, but I'd be obliged if you keep your voice down when you are inquiring about events that shape the firm. I'm afraid that the great luncheon voucher swindle too was before my time. But there was talk that Sir Reginald's son, your uncle Errol, the playboy, was involved. A pure speculation, naturally. Uncle Errol died, taking his secret to the grave. Uh, How much money was involved? A oh, great deal, running into many thousands of pounds, but still not sufficient to cover the gambling debts incurred in many years of wild spending. And the records? Uh, a, a lack, alas. The fire? A towering inferno. As uh, it was a black period in the firm's history. Why doesn't someone do something about keeping a new set of records? Nobody has the time. And we are looking to the future, not back into the past. You have the time. Me? Where on earth you get that idea? You don't seem to do much work. Oh, uh, uh, you've been taken in, as indeed most people are, by my effortless style of working. On the surface I appear calm and unruffled, gliding like a swan on the river of commerce. <laughs> but under the water there is a lot going on. Well, I think you're the right person for the job. Oh, let us stop this foolish talk <laughs> and say no more about it. You'll be hearing from us, Mr. Bristow. Cheers! It always surprises me, in an organisation as big as Chester Perry's, how quickly word gets around. I had no sooner taken my seat the next morning when Hickford, of Goods Inward, struggled through the door carrying a bundle of magazines. Here it is, Bristow. Mm -hmm. Bumper summer number of the Chester Perry House Journal. Oh, oh, oh great. I'm having fish and chips tonight. And fish and chips always taste better eaten out of a house journal. Mm. <laughs> mm. 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 Bristow, mm. 
I was talking with the postboy yesterday, and he mentioned you were interested in keeping some kind of unofficial record of things that go on within the walls of this building. Mm -hmm. Things like the great tea trolley disaster and any other scandals that reach your ears. Oh, I'm afraid the postboy is reading about mm, the garden He mentioned that but... you maintained your family archives, mm -hmm. which were concerned with military matters. Ah, that is true, Hickford. My family fought all over the world. And in every theatre of war, they played their part. Their bleached bones bear silent tribute. Bleached bones suggest, dare I say it, skeletons in the cupboard? Ah, we have those, of course, like most families. Except that ours are written up. <laughs> Actions that brought shame and ignominy to the Bristows are all there, Hickman. Mm. Warts and all. <laughs> I refer you to Cousin George Bristow of the Royal Engineers whose temporary bridge across the Bosphorus collapsed, mm. sending 20 of their best men to a watery grave, Ooh. and who died at the hands of a hastily recruited firing squad. <laughs> yes. Yes. Or old Yeller of Bristol, the black sheep of the family, mm. whose act of treachery mm. led him to end up tied to a cannon in Quebec. Bristol, what mm. you have just told me shows that you are the ideal person to keep an unofficial set of records. Oh, yes. and, and I have a suggestion to put forward for your consideration. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether you are aware of this, but mm. the House Journal is always looking for items that would be of interest to its readers, and the project you are contemplating is exactly the sort of stuff we have in mind. <laughs> what the devil is going on out here? <laughs> ah, Mr Hickford, I didn't see you there. Good morning, Mr Fudge. Mm. May I present you with your copy of the journal. Oh! <laughs> now, I, I was discussing with Mr Bristow here the possibility of his doing a series of articles for future publication. Bristow? <laughs> uh, well, I, I suppose you know your business, but uh, he does have his work to do. Oh, I don't think they will affect his work, will they, Mr Bristow? Yeah, well, not very much, but they are bound to affect it a little. It's the time factor. Uh, uh, perhaps I'd better not do the mistake, but I don't want Mr. Fudge to feel. Oh, dear. <laughs> Get on with them. Uh, but finish them as quickly as you can. He's probably a little put out. Uh, He's always sending his poems in with forever returning them. Mm -hmm. Our readers don't seem to care for poetry. Mr. Fudge writes poetry. It's funny that. You can never tell the type of person that writes poetry. All sorts of people take it up. You astonish me. Fudge writes poetry. What kind of poetry? Countryside, floppy rabbits, hip-hip-hopping uh, summer lawns, wide-eyed moths ogling a big round moon. You're kidding. It's quite good, really, but not for our readers. They prefer blood and guts. That's why your scandalous stuff will knock them dead, even if you follow. Oh, I do indeed. Indeed I do. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> Morning, Mr Jones. May I present you with your copy of the bumper summer number of the House Journal? You never give up, do you? You must have a hide like a rhinoceros. And in spite of all the things they say, you still keep producing it. <laughs> What's this picture on the front supposed to be? Well, it's a picture of the assembly line at our northern branch. Is it really? <laughs> it looks as if it's done with a potato. You know what I mean? You cut a potato and dip it in paint. We used to do it at school. Oh, no, I'm sorry you feel that way about it. It was done by an amateur. No. Well, I can see that. Assembly line, is it? <laughs> Staffed by Teletubbies, is it? <laughs> oh, ignore him, Higford. Let me see that. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <Tell> it, <laughs> Very good, Jones. <laughs> you won't be laughing at the next issue, Mr Jones. Mr Bristow is doing a series for us. A series? What about? I'm not at liberty to say at this moment in time. Uh, I know. It's about Bristow's family. Old hat, that military stuff. Bang, bang, you're dead. <laughs> boring, boring. There are people who care about the nation's history, Jones. Thinking people, cultured people, not thick yobbos like the sort of people you... Yeah. Know. Yeah. Now, the gentlemen, please, calm yourselves. Now, I must go, I'm afraid. There are people anxiously waiting for their bumper summer number. In your dreams. Thank you, Mr Bristow. We'll be in touch. Bristow, I don't know how you can do it. Buttering up to Hickford so you can get yourself into the House Journal. You don't read it, so it shouldn't bother yeah, you. I do read it. In fact, it might surprise you to know that I occasionally submit stuff. Oh, be ridiculous. 
<laughs> you writing in your dreams? You couldn't write to save your life. It might interest you to know that I sent in some poems a couple of weeks ago. You write poetry? You see, I knew you'd be surprised. You're not the only one with literary pretensions. What kind of poetry do you write? Never you mind. Jones, I am interested. I might have seen some of your scribbles. No, you wouldn't. Hickford doesn't like poetry. He's a Philistine. But he has a magazine, and everybody likes to see their work in print. I write nature poems. Floppy bunnies, hip, 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 hopping on summer's lawns. Wide-eyed moths, ogling a big round moon. That's right. I say, that's quite good. Yeah. Floppy bunnies, wide-eyed moths. Did you just make that up? Uh, uh, yes. Well, where was I? I'm quite impressed with that. I had no idea. I may have put a few lines of poetry in my new series. Something simple. Let's see. Roses of red, violets of blue. Hmm? I must confess I have no liking for poetry. Agreeing with Charles Dickens in the person of Sam Weller in that it is unnatural, and in particular I have no time whatsoever for poems on nature. What little enthusiasm I have is reserved for such stirring titles as How Horatius Kept the Bridge or The Siege at Lucknow and other epics connected with the military. It is, to my mind, extraordinary that two opposites such as Jones and Fudge should, unbeknownst to each other, share a love of poetry, and in particular, poems of nature. And I mentioned this to Mrs Purdy, the tea lady, when she entered that afternoon. Tea up! Come and get it! Uh, my usual, please. Uh, Darjeeling with the slice uh, of lemon. Oh, Samba! Oh, holy <laughs> mackerel, Mrs Purdy! Even I, as a hardened and shameless tea drinker, pale to the very gills when I see the flood that threatens to engulf us all at the turn of your tap. <laughs> Go on, get that down, you, yeah. and tell me what's new in the buying department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mrs. Purdy, did you know that both Mr. Jones and Mr. Fudge write poetry? Well, I know Mr. Fudge does, mm. so I'm not surprised about Mr. Jones. The strangest mm. people like rhyming things. Mm. My husband likes rhyming things. Mm. He says it's to relieve his inhibitions. Yet to look at him, you'd think butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Daft he is. Mm. He likes military poems like The Charge of the Light Brigade by mm. Alfred Lord Tennyson. <laughs> half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the six hand. Mm. Do you know that one? Yes, Mrs. Purdy, I do. <laughs> You write yourself. Sometimes I write things about nature. Floppy rabbits hip hip hopping o'er summer lawns. Wide eyed moths ogling a big round moon. Hey, that's one of mine. How did you know uh, it? Of course, just a little something. What do you mean it's one of yours? I wrote it the other day in the laundress in Turnpike Lane. You wrote it? Yes, I did it while I was waiting for the long spin. Mrs. Purdy. Did you tell anyone about it? Oh, one or two people. I told Mr Fudge. That's how I know he writes poetry. You told Mr Fudge? Yes, he thought it was good. He told me so. Mrs Purdy, another cup of tea. My head is spinning like the dryer of the washing machine and the laundrette in Turnpike Lane. Yeah, well, wait. Don't pour yet. Let me take cover. <laughs> Too late. It seemed to me incredible that a man who held the office of cheap buyer in an organisation as big as the Chester Perry Company should resort to filching poems from a tea lady. It was a scoop for my first article for the House Journal. But there were complications, the first of which was that, with Fudge knowing I was doing a series for the aforementioned, he would realise I was behind it, and that would be fatal. After all, I got to eat, don't I? Having no knowledge of what it takes to be a poet, I had no idea of how they think. How strong was their desire to dash off a rhyming couplet? Would they risk life and limb for the right word to complete an ode? 
How far would they go to get le mot juste? I needed to know before I made a start on my expose, and I took my first steps to the unravelling of the poet's mind that afternoon. <laughs> Here I, I, oh, dear. thank you, young man. You're out of condition, Mr. Bristow. Well, not. I've been tearing up a few telephone directories to work up an appetite for lunch. Well? Well, what? You want to go somewhere. You say a number. Which floor do you want? I don't want to go anywhere. I need information. Cost you. Cost me. Information don't come free, nor cheap. You should know that, Mr. Bristow. <laughs> How much? Depends on what you want information about. Is it investment? Is it home or abroad? It's not Is to it... do with business matters. It's about that kid who's always in trouble for scribbling graffiti all over the place. Rude rhymes, obscene poems. He used to call himself the Phantom Scribbler. Mm. You mean Little Red Purdy, the tea lady's son? Yeah, possibly. I wouldn't know. But if you say so... He did the one about the little ducks. <coughs> That's the boy. I want to find him. What's the time? 11.30. He'll be in the broom cupboard at the end of the corridor on the top floor. What will he be doing there? Hiding out. He was going to scribble something on the boardroom table at 11.15. When you get to the cupboard, tap three times soft and once loud. Good job. Mr. Bristow, open the door, Red. What do you want? I want to talk to you. Is it about the boardroom table? No, it's about poetry. Oh. Just a minute. Come in quick, Mr. Bristow, before anyone sees you. Yeah. Good afternoon, Red. You were a fool to come, Mr. Bristow. Mm? They may do a cupboard-to-cupboard -cupboard search when they read what the Phantom Scribbler has written on the table. <clears throat> what have you written? He's written a poem about Sir Reginald Chester Perry and one of the typists. Why? Something going on between them? I don't know. Probably. He's a man, she's a woman. You mean he made something up? Yeah. A scandal. That's not very nice. It's not meant to be nice. It's meant to get tongues wagging. That's what the Phantom Scribbler does. He sets the cat among the pigeons. You talk about the Phantom Scribbler as if he was someone other than yourself. He is. He's the dark side of me. The dark side? The part of me I can't control. I hear a rhyme and I'm powerless to help myself. I'm inextricably drawn into the thing that is the Phantom Scribbler. Mm. I'm powerless against it, Mr Bristow. I've got to write it down. You are saying you will hear a rhyme, and you must write it down? That's right. The rhyme triggers off a compulsion, and the creature inside me will not set me free until I make it mine. Mm -hmm. Would you steal someone else's rhyme? No. Ah, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. But he would. Hmm? The dark, inner person within me. Yeah, he would. Holy mackerel! Does that mean there's a dark side to fudge? An even deeper and darker side than the deep and dark side we already know. I don't know what you're talking about. It doesn't matter. I'm off. You haven't seen me? I had a feeling I was on strange territory. Good Lord. Yep. Mr. Bristow, what are you doing up here? Oh, uh, Hewitt, you made me jump. I might ask you the same question. And considering I have the advantage of both height and weight, I think you must answer first. Oh, I often come up here to the director's floor to get the feel of the place. I don't want to be caught napping when the call comes. Um... Did you just come out of that broom cupboard? Uh, cupboard? Uh, did, ah, yes. <laughs> I was returning a broom. 
to the cupboard. Was um, Little Red in there? Uh, there was someone in there. Uh, Whether it was Little Red, I wouldn't know. Oh, come off it, Mr Bristow. It must have been Little Red. That means he's done the job. <laughs> he's a lad, isn't he? I wouldn't know. I don't know whether it's him or the inner man that's a bit of a lad. Back at my desk, I tried to marshal my thoughts. If, as Little Red told me, the poet has an inner man, a compulsion to use other people's rhymes, he cannot be held responsible, since this other self is all-powerful. This means that Fudge is not to blame for lifting Mrs Purdy's flip-floppy rabbits and needs only to see a psychiatrist to sort out his problems. I was trying to put this into some semblance of order for the article when the door opened. You, Mr Bristow. Uh, ah. I've been looking all over for you. What can I do for you, Miss Sunman? I just wanted to congratulate you. Mm? Mr Hickford says you're going to do a series of articles for the House Journal. That's right. Will you let me type them for you? Oh, I don't know, Miss Sunman. You were already typing out my novel, Living Death in the Buying Department, an expose of big business. That's right. Mm. I do it Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. When do you type Babes in the Office, my introduction to the white-collar world? Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you only get the weekends free? (laughs) Not really. That's when I do a little writing of my own. You write? I had no idea. Only poetry. Silly, really. I write... Nature poems. Uh, don't tell me. Floppy rabbits, hip-hip-hopping, or summer lawn stuff? Who told you? Practically everyone I've spoken to today. That's wonderful. Wide-eyed moths ogling the big round moon. Mm. Squirrels topsy-turvying from bow to bow. Holy mackerel! Squirrels topsy... You did write it. Did you tell anyone? I told Mrs Purdy. So Mrs Purdy has an inner man, too. Miss Sunman told Mrs Purdy, Mrs Purdy told Fudge, and Fudge sends it up to the House Journal, claiming it to be his. What a story this is going to make. Came the day I handed over the first of my articles to a delighted Hickford. Well done, Bristow. I'm thrilled. I can't wait to read it. Yes, thank you. I hope you won't mind me saying this, Hickford, but during the writing, I discovered that you are completely wrong about your readership. Mm-hmm. What way? Well, everyone I've spoken to during my research is involved in writing nature poems, and your claim that no one is interested in poetry is completely erroneous. Well, I don't Shh. see. We writers know our public. How else could we bear our souls so freely? A few weeks later, I arrived at the building to find a babble of noise and discovered the cause of the excitement was that the first copies of the bumper summer number of the House Journal were out. Well, Pilkington, I knew it was good stuff when I heard Bristow mention it. I didn't realise how good it was, though, till I saw it in print. A hit, I'd say, a very palpable hit. Forcing my way through chattering lines of people, I found myself at the front. You'll have to queue like everyone else. As a contributor, I do not see why I should have to. Here you are, then. Owing to unprecedented demand, only one copy per person. Thank you. It was an excellent front cover. Quote, <clears throat> the Chester Perry House Journal management are pleased to announce that starting today, a new and brilliant feature by a new and brilliant contributor, which will appear regularly within these covers, can be found on page 13. Splendid. Page 13. 10. 11. 12. Here we are. We proudly present the first of a series of nature poems by Sir Reginald Chester Perry, our beloved firm's founder. Floppy rabbits, hip hip hopping, or summer lawns. (laughs) 
Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, John Glover as Fudge, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy and Red, and Ian Kelland as the Lift Boy, with Roger Lloyd-Pack as Hicks by Graham Harper, the director, Neil Cargill. <laughs>